I want to start here this morning. I'm sure you guys have all had the experience at one point or another where you move to a new place or you're visiting a different city or something and you ask somebody, hey, where is this thing? And they'll give you this long string of directions and it makes absolutely no sense because you're like, I have no context and no hook for any of that. When I started going to college in North Dakota, I had a lot of friends, a lot of roommates who were from these various small towns in North Dakota. And I remember talking to a roommate once. I said, where are you from? He says, Pheasanton. And I'm like, I have never heard of that. And he's like, where, where is that? And he says, well, it's near Hawley. I haven't heard of that either. Where is that? Well, it's near Carrington. Like, this could go on for days like this. It's like, look, I know where five cities are in North Dakota. If it's not Minot, Jamestown, you know, just, just, just anyway. Drive me nuts. I, Bismarck, yeah, exactly. I tell you this because it's kind of how this, this story that Bud just read for us is. It's one of those things where we read this about Jesus going up the mountain and being transformed, and it's kind of like we don't have a hook for it. We don't have a place for it. And you might have been in church every decade. You might have been in church for decades, and it's still one of those where you're like, I don't know what to do with that one. And it's a story that doesn't resonate with us easily. But on the flip side, I think this one is one of those that really shows us something about how we live today and what we need to understand for life today. So go ahead and put that first slide up there from the Gospel of Matthew, and let's walk through this. Let me just locate this one for you. So, perfect. So what's happening is this is almost the end of the ministry of Jesus. He's been teaching, he's been preaching, and he is up north. And in the previous passage, what's happened is Jesus has asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And, they, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the one that God has sent to free us. And Jesus is like, yep, yeah, that's it. You got it. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And then so six days later, Peter, James, John, and Jesus start walking up the mountain. And as they do, Jesus is transformed. He's transfigured. His face starts glowing like the sun. His clothes become bright, blinding white. And then uh, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, see Jesus talking to two guys, Moses and Elijah. Now, if you're from the same period as these disciples, if you're Jewish and you've known this, known the stories, you would have a hook. Moses and Elijah are the personification of the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament, what the Jewish people just would have called the Bible. And this is Moses, who got the law from God at Mount Sinai, and Elijah, the greatest of all the prophets. And the Jewish tradition was neither of them had died. They'd just both been taken up into heaven. So here they are, two witnesses, because the law said you had to have two witnesses, saying, this is the guy. And Peter has this very human reaction. He's like, let's build three tents, and we can camp out here, and it'll be awesome. He's doing this very reasonable thing of saying, okay, God's here. Let's camp out here. Let's stay here. This is the place we want to be. And then what happens? This cloud comes down, and the voice speaks out of a cloud saying, this is my son. Listen to him. And the disciples have this very reasonable reaction. I would recommend to do what they did if this ever happens to you. They fall flat in their face, and they're terrified, Okay. I think that's a good strategy in this place. And then Jesus comes over and says, don't be afraid. And everybody else is gone. And there's a lot to this story. Let's deal with the theological piece of it first. What's happening here is Jesus is giving us a glimpse of who he's going to be. Because he's heading from here. He's going to head down to Jerusalem, and all the events that we're familiar with for Holy Week, for the triumphal entry, the Last Supper, being crucified and raised to new life, all these things are going to happen. 
And it is something that they are getting a glimpse of. It's something that they're getting a glimpse of his future glory. Now, as interesting as that is, I actually want to focus in on Peter's reaction because this tells us something new for us or tells us something about ourselves. When Peter says, let's camp out here, let's be in this spot, he's standing on a, two things, his human reaction, his human gut feeling, but also who he was as a Jewish person. Go ahead and show that picture of uh, me with the hat on there, please. Perfect. There we go. Okay. I know, I look so stylish, don't I? Okay. This is back in 2017 when I got to go to Israel. Incidentally, we're going again in November. If you want to go, just stop by the welcome desk. we got flyers out there. Catch me afterwards. I'd love to have you come with. But this is me on the Temple Mount. This is the place where the temple stood. Now, behind me is the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim mosque. And in there is the foundation stone. And that is about where the temple was located. This giant flat field right there where the temple was. And 2,000 years before I was there, Jesus would have been there with the disciples at this space. And that's where Herod the Great had rebuilt the temple. Okay, So that was built about contemporaneous with Jesus' time, a little bit before. A thousand years before that, Solomon had built the first temple. And before that, what had happened is the people of Israel had been given instructions to build the tabernacle, which was a mobile temple. So they started to build that in the wilderness when God calls them out of Egypt. And then when they conquer the promised land, God tells them to park it right at that spot. And then a thousand years, well, a thousand years before Solomon, 4,000 years ago from today, give or take, Abraham is told by God to make a sacrifice on that same spot. So for 4,000 years from Abraham to today, people have been praying in and around that spot because they're saying God spoke to us here. God told us to come to this place. And one of my favorite memories when I got to go in 2017 was going to the Western Wall, or what's called the Wailing Wall. And it's probably about 50 yards from where I'm standing right there. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. It's this big retaining wall that holds the dirt in for that place I'm standing. And Jews and Christians have been coming to that wall and putting prayers into that wall for centuries because it's by the temple. It's that place where we've come to pray. And the thing is, is we do that. We say, this is where we want to go. We want to go to those places where God has visited us before. We want to go to those places where God has worked. And most of us have never been to the Temple Mount, but the principle still holds We want to go back to those places where God has spoken to us. We want to go back to those ways that God has operated in our lives. As much as I joke about my fondness for North Dakota, as much as I joke about the 80s being the high point of Western civilization, and it is, I will defend that, part of the reason I say that is for me, those are places where God spoke to me. Those are places where God moved in my life. And we do that as human beings where we say, you know, that was that place and we want to go back there. There are certain songs that when I hear, I am instantly back in like 1988 or 1992. And we do that thing where we try and go back there. One of the weird things about being a pastor I thought I was hearing something through the sound system. I don't know if it's my mic or something. But one of the weird things through being a pastor is you get people putting on you what they knew and the way God worked at some point in their life. And they'll have some fond memory of something and say, this was amazing and it's how God moved in my life and I want to recreate that. I mean, you understand how that happened, but I once had a guy offer me $1,000 if I would chant the liturgy some Sunday morning. And I, I said no, 
for a couple of reasons, mainly because some of the musicians among you have heard my singing, and it is not pretty. And I would have felt bad about doing, taking his money. He probably would have paid it, too. But it's a thing where it's like we try and go back to the place where God moved us. We try and go back, and we don't try and go to those places where God is calling us now, where God is saying, I want you to be in this place. If you'd put up that verse from John, I'd appreciate it. The beginning of John has this really interesting statement. Let me just read this for you. And the word became flesh, that's referring to Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Now, it's usually translated in English as he has dwelt among us. But you could also translate that as he has made his tabernacle among us. Remember what I said earlier? The tabernacle was the mobile temple. And so they go from play, and they would take the tabernacle to follow where God called them to and to worship. And so what Jesus is saying here, what John is saying about Jesus, is that we have this ability to encounter God in all these different places. We have this ability to encounter God in new and different places, not the places we've always been. And that's tremendously freeing. Because so often we think, well, i got to go to church. i got to go to these holy places to meet God. And the reality is, is that wherever you need God, wherever he's calling you, he will meet you. The people of Israel met God in the wilderness. They met God in these unexpected places. The Gideon you see meeting the angel of the Lord out on the threshing floor. And God saying to him, this is what I want you to do. And the beautiful thing is for those points of trauma, those points of scariness, those points where you feel like you're alone, it's where God meets you and God calls you. But that doesn't mean there isn't tension. That doesn't mean that there isn't a place where you're scared. That doesn't mean that there's a place where you feel lost because you want to go back to where it was before. I was having this really interesting discussion and realization this week. Most of us in this room have grown up in church. I did myself. And you grew up with Sunday school, with a junior high and confirmation, and high school ministry, and all those things. And you assign a value to it. And you remember it fondly. And you think thinking those were good days and great things. But because of the way the culture is, less and less people in America are growing up in church. And less and less people experience that. The good news is, however, we're reaching people like that. And we have more and more people in our congregation, including in leadership, who grew up outside of the church. And the tension becomes, and it's a good tension to have, they didn't grow up with those same values. They don't assign the same memories. They don't assign the same nostalgia to it. And what we need to remember is God is calling us to meet people in new ways. God is always calling us to those different places to speak that new language for every new generation. And, it, and it's going to play out differently for these little munchkins that we're going to baptize. It's going to play out differently for these new generations. Go ahead and put that last verse up, please. Which is a really interesting thing I want to show you. And what Jesus is doing is he's showing us what he's going to be and what we're all going to be. When Jesus is raised from the dead, he's transformed. He still has the nails, uh, the nail wounds in his hands and his side. He eats with the disciples, but he's different. He's transformed. He walks through walls. They don't recognize him immediately. He's changed. And the way it talks in the New Testament is that we too will be changed. We too will be made new. And that beautiful verse from Corinthians is behind me that everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. And so one of the things I want you to understand and want you to think about is you're going to be changed continually into his likeness. We're called to become more loving, more kind, more patient, more forgiving, like he is. And part of, the transit, part of the question, part of the trouble for us, is do we want that? 
Pastor Anna asked a really good question a couple weeks ago, and it's so good I wanted to bring it back. She asked, what part of your life are you hanging on to that you know you need to let go of? For some of us, we want to hang on to those grudges. We want to hang on to that self-centered part of ourselves. And what God is calling us to do is to be transformed. Just as Jesus is transformed, we're called to be transformed. Just as Jesus goes throughout this world, we're called to go to those new places. The thing is, we so often get confused and we think we are just here to wait till we die and then we get a free pass into heaven. But what God is saying is no. He's here to redeem this world, to transform this world. You read through Revelation, you read through a lot of the Old Testament, it's talking about changing this world, but making it new. This place, a new heaven, a new earth. There's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. And we're called to live in that reality now and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to find you. You would help us to follow you. You would help us to know you and be transformed into your likeness. And we might give you all the glory, now and always. Amen.